My name is Taylor. My wife, Kristen, and I, we have the honor and privilege of being the lead pastors here at Trinity. And we're so thankful that you're with us today, whether it's your first time in church or your first time in a long time. We want you to know that you belong and, and, and we're thankful that you're with us today. And I also want to look right into the camera and say what's up to all of our friends joining us online. Some of us are joining us from the East Coast, the West Coast, outside of the global church. Can we make some noise for all of our guests? Make sure they can hear you online. Come on, let them, hear, let, let them feel your love. Awesome, we love you. We love you, but hey, we are in the countdown to Christmas, Advent season. What is Advent? It quite literally just means arrival. And for the last uh, 2,000 years or so, the church has been celebrating this countdown to Christmas, and that's what we're doing. We're ca- Can you guys believe it? Christmas is next week. I, if, for those of you online, you couldn't hear it, but the room just went... Oh, God, we haven't finished our Christmas shopping. <laughs> oh, God, we haven't bought all of our gifts. Oh, God, the party's still not planned. Anybody else stressed about Christmas next week? Uh, there's a few things to do. But we love Christmas. We're so thankful uh, for Christmas holiday. In fact, it's exciting because next, next Sunday is an incredible day. It's Christmas Eve, and the data has just come out. This is, this is true. The data was just released by Barna that uh, for the last several years, Easter Sunday has been the most attended weekend for the church across, across the country. But now, this week, the data has confirmed it that Christmas Eve is the most attended service of the entire year. What does that mean? It means that of all the other opportunities you have, the other 51 Sundays of the year, this upcoming weekend is our best opportunity. It's my best opportunity. It's your best opportunity to reach the people who are in our lives who are far from God, but they're close to us. How many of you have some coworkers who you know need Jesus? (laughs) You know your manager does. Come on, somebody. But all of us, we have friends and family members. We even got neighbors who don't like us. We've got, we got people who we know need Jesus. And next Sunday is our best opportunity to invite them. Christmas Eve happens to fall on a Sunday next week. And man, it's an incredible gift. That's why we're pulling out all the stops. The reality is, is that Christmas is about Jesus, period. But our culture celebrates Santa Claus and Christmas gifts and candy canes and cocoa and pictures and all that kind of stuff. So you know what we're gonna do? We are gonna leverage the, the, uh, our culture, and we are going to use whatever we can to get people into God's house, because if they can get into God's house and they can encounter his presence, their lives can be transformed forever. Amen? Amen. You see, Jesus is our message. What does that mean? It means methods will come and go, but our message will stay the same. You see, I will use any method short of sin. We'll use any method to to preach the message of Jesus Christ. We're not committed to a style. We're not committed to one way of doing church. It's not about our preference. It's about the message, about the name above every name. It's about celebrating and preaching the good news of Jesus. Amen? So that's what Christmas is all about. And man, I'm really looking forward to next week. But we're going to dive right in today. Uh, I, I want to read the Christ, a part of the Christmas story today. And it's found in Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, Jesus is born. And there's these shepherds. And the story goes that there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. They were keeping watch over their flocks at night. And then suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. See, here's the thing about the presence of God is if, if you're not used to being in God's presence, if you're not used to being in God's house, if you're not used to being in God's community, if you're not used to the presence of God, there's a whole lot of fear and intimidation about stepping into that. The reality is that some of you, you've been hurt by church. You've been hurt by, uh, by other local communities. But the truth is, is no matter what your past is with God's house, I don't want you to walk into the doors of this church terrified. I don't want you to be afraid because, because whenever it's really God's presence, whenever you step into God's house, it doesn't matter who you are, or where you're from, or what your past is, that the love of God is there. That it's not a place of fear. It's not a place of condemnation and judgment. There is nothing to be afraid of in God's presence. And that's true for you today, but it was true for these guys. They were terrified because the glory of the Lord shone about them. And it says that the Lord said to them, don't be afraid. (laughs) There's nothing to be afraid of here. I bring you good news. See, the message of Jesus is good news. It's good news about a a savior who came to to love you today. It's not bad news about your sin. It's good news about your savior. And I come to bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, 
Bethlehem. A savior has been born to you. His, he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Another way to say it is that he is God. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. We'll talk about that next week. And then suddenly, it went from one angel to a great company of heavenly hosts. They appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. You see, in this Advent season, we're taking time and we're, and we're, and we're getting pretty topical because Advent is about remembering the hope of Jesus. It's about remembering the joy of Jesus. It's about remembering the love of Jesus. And today we're talking about the peace that Jesus offers us. Elbow your neighbor and say, you need some peace. Elbow your other neighbor and say, no, you really need peace. Okay, now just give someone the peace sign. Say peace, yo. Peace, 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 peace. What is peace? You, you, you read this in, in the Bible, and the reality is, is every single week I, I come to church, and I, I'll ask people, hey, like, what can I pray w- w- with you about? And I mean, without fail, people are always constantly saying, oh, pastor, I'm just, I just need peace. I just need peace. And I'm like, great. What do you mean? Like, 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 are you hoping for like Zen? Are you hoping for like, are you at war? Like, what's going on? Like, like you want peace, like in the Middle East? Like, come on, like what's going on? And uh, what is peace? What is this promise called peace that we read about in the Bible? The gift of Christmas is the gift of Jesus. And Jesus isn't, is our savior, but he is the prince of peace. And, And peace is found in a person. His name is Jesus. So what is this peace that is being offered to us? Well, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's written in Hebrew, and in the New Testament, it's written in Greek. Uh, th- there's two different words for the word peace. Shalom is the Old Testament word. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've met someone named Shalom. Shalom. And then there's uh, Irene, which is actually the, the New Testament word. So if your name's Irene, your name means peace. We love you. Peace to Irene. Uh, but here's the reality, that the English language is quite limited with this word peace, Because the Hebrew and the Greek, there is such a rich depth to what these words mean. When we think peace, we tend to think like a peaceful attitude, like peace. Like I say peace unto you and like, and like we think like sitting on the beach, calm waves lapping on the sand. Your kids are not there. (laughs) Your boss isn't calling you, right? Like, like we think, ah, oh, peace. And we think, we tend to think like tranquility and rest and zen and all these other words, but, but peace is so much more than that. Yes, a peaceful attitude is part of the peace that God promises us. The Bible teaches us that there is a peace that passes all understanding. And this is in Philippians 4. What's Paul saying? The peace that transcends understanding. But Paul is saying that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a storm, you can have peace. You can have this peaceful attitude, this restfulness. And I want to be clear, I want this for you. A lot of us, you walk in the door today and you're struggling with things like anxiety and, and there's a lot of, and you're struggling with restless nights. You're not finding rest. You're not at peace and you're struggling with that. And I just declare the peace that passes understanding over your life as you find rest in Jesus. I want that for you. But this isn't quite what the promise of Christmas is. This idea of this tranquil, this, this idea of a peaceful attitude isn't quite the declaration of what Christmas is about. You see, it's glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace on whom his favor rests. Peace, quite literally, in this context is not just about my personal feelings. This declaration of peace is a declaration of a freedom from war. Peace has come in the name of a king and that king is establishing a kingdom that is going to conquer death, hell, and the grave. It is freedom from, from the grave. It is freedom from sin. It is, it, it is freedom from war. That's what this, this word shalom in the Hebrew quite literally means. It means this type of, of peace. And I'm not naive enough to think, see, the truth is some of us were here today and we don't have the peace that we're asking for because we're at war with other people in our lives. See, a lot of us, we live at war. We, we're in relationship with Jesus, but we're at war with our families. That's why Christmas is such a terrifying time for some of us. You see, 
We, we love God, but we're at war with our coworkers. We're at war with our neighbors. We are fighting. We, there's unforgiveness. There, is, there, is, um, uh, th- there are moments of bitterness towards people. We are at war with others. And when, as long as we are at war with others, we can have no peace. So some of us, we want peace, and the solution is going to be through reconciliation. See, a lot of us, we don't want reconciliation. We want revenge. But Paul says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God. Friends, God will fight your battles. This is the promise of peace. That leave room for God's wrath. For it's, it is mine to avenge. God will handle it. See, a lot of us, the peace we're looking for is going to come when we learn to forgive. The peace we're looking for is going to come when we learn to apologize. A lot of the peace we're looking for is going to come when we learn how to reconcile. What is peace? Yes, it's this attitude, but it's first, it's first this, this freedom from war. I call it freedom from war because we need deliverance. See, some of us, we're, we're at odds with other people because we are still living in bondage to pride. See, some of us, we're at war with our family because we're living in bondage to arrogance and anger and haughtiness. And what Jesus comes to offer you is freedom from all of those things that is bringing division into the relationships that God has entrusted to you. See, we have an opportunity to have peace in our lives and it's peace in our relationships. But that peace, that war that we're fighting, it's not just in relationship with people. That war... Some of us are fighting is, a, is the war against sin. And I want to be really clear. A lot of us are fighting a war against sin that has already been won on the cross. You see, some of us, we're not experiencing peace. We're not living with the shalom. We're not experiencing the irene that, that, that the Bible promises us because we're still picking up our past. We've already been freed. We've already been forgiven, but we're still going back. So we're not at peace. This is why in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. It kind of reminds me of what the Bible says about these shepherds who have these heavenly hosts surrounding them. And then it goes on to say, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Some of us were entangled so we don't have peace. But Jesus is offering us peace, peace from the, the, this fight against sin that Jesus has already won. I want to be really clear. I'm not suggesting that if you're still sinning that you, are, uh, th- that you aren't saved or if you're still struggling that, 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 that uh, I'm condemning you. That's not what I'm saying. But some of us, we have been so entangled with sin that we have accepted it as part of who we are. We have decided that we can't get by without this substance. We have decided that we can't get by without this behavior, without this person. We have, we have taken it upon ourselves, but what Jesus came to declare over you today is that there is freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from war, freedom from fighting against others, freedom in Jesus' name. That is what peace is all about. Some of us, it's our struggle with sin. I just want to encourage you. Struggle, if you are struggling with sin, don't give in, struggle well. What does it mean to struggle well? It means when you fall, when you get entangled to sin, when you fall, fall forward. What does it mean to fall forward? Get on your knees, repent, and stand back up and allow the Holy Spirit to forgive you and keep moving forward in Jesus' name. See, not everything is about deliverance. Some of it's about discipline. And, and, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. We like that one. But then it's like, you know, like all the ones that not, we don't really like, like patience and gentleness and, and, and kindness, goodness, you know, faithfulness and self-control. And this self-control is, is, is a promise from God to help us get untangled from the ways of this world. So what is peace? Yeah, it's this attitude. Yes, it's freedom from war. But I love the word shalom because it quite literally means wholeness, and completeness. See, the peace that Jesus is offering you is wholeness today. Look at the image, paint the picture in your mind of, a, of an old stone wall. It's stones laid on top of each other in an organized fashion, and they're all different sizes, and, and the old stone wall gets higher as you stack those stones. And it doesn't take a genius to figure it out if you've ever played Jenga as a little kid, but if you pull out too many of those stones in that stone wall, that wall with its fractures, with its holes, with its gaps, is gonna be easily toppled over because it is incomplete, because it is fractured, because it is broken. 
Shalom, peace, that God offers is like that stone wall. A stone wall that has gaps, but God has come in and he has filled in and he has completed. So when the storms of life, when the weight of the world comes and presses upon us, we do not topple over. See, a lot of us, we've been looking for peace with other things to fill in the gaps. We've been turning to other relationships and substances and looking for notoriety and success in this world, but the only thing that can fill the gap is the one who stood in the gap on the cross for you and me. His name is Jesus, and he offers us the wholeness and the completeness that he is giving us today. This is what the peace of God is all about, the shalom of God. It's about wholeness. That's why in 1 Thessalonians, Paul teaches us. that He says this, pray, now may the God of peace, the God of wholeness, the God of shalom, the God of Irene, May the, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and your whole soul and your whole body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. You see, the wholeness that God is offering us is this word called holiness. And holiness means to be set apart. To, 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 to say that every part of my life is set apart for God. Because if we're turning to other places for our source of peace, there will always be brokenness. There will always be fractures in the wall. But God is here today to offer us wholeness and peace. Amen? Yeah. See, the reality, today we're talking about peace. And a lot of us, we're struggling to live with peace because we are, we are going to different sources for it. And, and today, I, the, the title of this sermon, it's really simple. It's five points to help us real quick. And I'm just calling it the source of peace. What is your source of peace? Well, the answer is that it's God. But I'm giving you five things about God uh, that are going to teach us about how to tap into this peace if you need this peace today. The first one is that we need God's presence. We need God's presence, amen? You see, this is why we worship. I, I, I love our church because don't we have the best worship team in all of New York City? Come on. I know that we do. We, we have the best worship team, and I love our church. It's not the biggest church, but it is the most passionate church, and we worship God loudly. We turn the volume up. We offer you earphones, uh, earplugs if you need them, because that's the way we like it, because we're going to worship God with passion and we're excited. But why do we worship? Well, the Bible says that, we, that God inhabits the praises of his people. And there's two things we need to understand about worship, that we need to learn how to do it corporately, and we have to learn how to do it privately, or personally is a better way. Because the reality is, is that for the last 2,000 years, the people of God have gathered together to worship God. Why? Because the, God says, I inhabit the praises of my people. You know, as much as, as important as it is, and it's going to be my next point, as important as it is to learn how to worship and pray and seek God on your own, I want to just be reminded that, that, that nothing really replaces the public gathering of the saints. I love church online. We have friends joining us, church online. So many of us, when we're traveling, when we're out of town, when we get sick, we, we need to tune in to church online. But I want to be really clear. That church online is not a replacement to church in real life. Church online is a supplement to, to, to our relationship with God. What, what's a supplement? Well, if you're trying to build muscle mass, if you got a, a coach at the gym and, and he was telling you to, that you needed to increase your protein intake, they might suggest that you take whey protein or maybe some protein bars. Why? Because, because it's a supplement. It's in, in addition to your regular, your regular diet. It's in addition to your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. And church online is in addition to all the, what God wants to do in real life community with people. Church online, we live love it but it can't replace being in God's presence with his people it's in this it, it, no, it, I, I, I'm teaching you something and it'll change your life it doesn't it, getting into God's house it's not just about hearing the word it's about re receiving a hug it's about having someone lay hands on you and praying it's about being next to a brother and sister and lifting up your hands and encountering the presence of God in a way that you just can't on your own it's about being together so we need, to, we need to learn about God's presence and we worship and I love what DeWitt says, it's not just Christian karaoke, it's worship. I sometimes wish we had the ball bouncing, dun, dun, dun. like that would be nice. But like, but like it's not Christian karaoke, These are, this is worship, a declaration for ourselves unto God. We need to learn about 
God's presence. I love what David says. He says, yes, my soul, find rest in God. Find peace. Find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Friends, our relationship with God shouldn't be a struggle. Our relationship with God should be a source of peace, a source of rest. And, and, and God's presence, it's, it's twofold. Like I said, it's about getting into his presence corporately, but we also have to learn to tap into his presence personally. You see, God's presence isn't, presence isn't just set aside for one hour on Sunday. No, God wants you to constantly live in his presence. God wants you to wake up tomorrow and carry his presence into that boardroom, into that classroom, into that courtroom. God wants you to carry his presence back to brunch tonight, back to your apartment, back to your block. The presence of God can go anywhere because we carry God's presence everywhere. But have you learned to recognize his presence? Have you learned to personally tap into his presence on a day-to-day basis? This is why we have to learn prayer. This is why we have to come together and corporately pray, but personally pray every day. And I'm really looking forward to it because, it, because it, we're at the end of a year, which means we're at the beginning of a new one. And as a church family, we always start the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I'm excited. It's launching on January 8th, and it's going to be a special time of prayer. But, but what is, why do we do this? Why do we take 21 days to pray and fast? Well, because if we're going to live in God's presence, two things must be happening in our life. We must be constantly connected to God, and we have to be continually learning how to disconnect from the world. Prayer and fasting. Prayer is about connection with God. Fasting is about disconnection from the world. And a lot of us, we're not experiencing the peace of God with our life because we're just too connected with the world. We're more in tune with culture than we are with God's spirit. We're more in tune with with, with the trends on TikTok than we are with, with the word of God. And I'm not saying that as a condemnation. I'm saying that as my first to say, you know what? I've got to... I I, want to connect more to God in 2024, and I want to disconnect from the things that are holding me back from his purpose in 2024. Amen? So it's going to be a powerful time. I'm looking forward to uh, being a part of it. Um, But but we're going to continue to tap into God's presence as we learn to pray. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. But in Isaiah, uh, the Bible says that those who hope, and and this word hope, uh, it it can be uh, translated to this word wait or rest. Those who rest in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God's presence offers us strength today. And if you need peace in the midst of chaos, you gotta learn to tap into God's presence. And then the next thing you gotta learn how to do is you gotta learn how to rest on God's promise. You gotta rest on God's promise. What's God's promise? Well, God's promise is found in God's word. And all throughout scripture, God is speaking to you and I, and he is making us promises. And we need promises from God to help us through the storms of this life. I, I love what, uh, what Psalms 119 says, my soul faints with longing for your salvation. Can we be honest? Not all of us feel like this. Not all of us long for God's presence. Not all of us long for intimacy and closeness with him. He says, my soul faints with longing for you, but I have put my hope in your word. Not all of us are finding our hope in our peace and the promises found in God's word. But this is why in Lamentations, when Solomon's writing in the midst of lamenting, in the midst of, of sorrow, in the midst of depression, he says, yet in the midst of this chaos, I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. What's he calling to mind? God's word. He's saying, because of the, Lord's great, uh, of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. Have you learned how to rest on the promises of God when you're in the middle of a storm? You see, I, 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 I love that it's Christmas time and around this season, so many of us are traveling or we have friends coming to visit us. It's time of family. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you are, 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 uh, are going out of town for Christmas this, this year? Come on, just go, you make it some noise. Okay, that's about half the room. The rest of you, you staying home, staying, staying in New York City? Okay, okay, yeah, New Yorkers, we're excited about that. The reality is, uh, is that so many people are, even right now, we have friends who are guests in this service, and they're from out of town coming to New York City, because New York City, let's be honest, it's the capital of Christmas. Like, Christmas without New York is not Christmas at all, okay? Like, like Christmas was invented in New York City, okay? 
Like, I, 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 I kind of believe it. Um, but, but, but Christmas in New York, they go hand in hand. But so many of us are traveling. And I, I, I travel a lot. Uh, you know, I remember as a, uh, when I was just starting out in my ministry, one of my dreams was to travel and preach a lot. And as I've done that more and more, I'm just like, I don't want to get on any more planes. And I just want to stay home with my family. But, but I've traveled a lot. I've got a lot of miles. And I gotta be, I, I've learned something as I've become a frequent flyer. I've learned to, to be able to determine when I get on a flight who's a frequent flyer and who's brand new to this thing. <laughs> I can tell. And so can you. I remember just a few weeks ago, I, was, I sat down on a flight, and I'm the last one on the plane, because why get on the plane early? I don't need to do that. Like, like, like everyone who's kind of a new, some people want to get there early, sure, good for you. I'm the last guy on that flight. I'm alone, and they're like, is anyone else coming? And I'm like standing there being like, are you going to close the door yet? They're like, no, well, we have five more minutes. I'm like, I'll stand here. You know, like, I get on that plane last, and I remember coming and sitting down next to this guy, and he was, I, he was already worried. He was white knuckle in the... The, the seat, and I could tell that he was all freaked out. And I know I'm a pastor, and I know I'm supposed to bring peace to people who are in the midst of fear. But I put my headphones on, and I just try not to talk to him. <laughs> no, I, I, I ended up talking to him, trying to encourage him. It was his first time on a flight. And it was his first time. He has no experience, no proximity with airplanes, with air travel, just his first time. So he, he was nervous. And you, you, I thought he was nervous on takeoff. Do you know when he was really nervous? When we hit turbulence. <laughs> this is like a, like a man's man. And he was not a man's man when that turbulence hit. He was, he was scared. And, and, and that fear, to me in that moment, was so unrelatable. Because I have complete confidence in that airplane. I've been on so many. I'm on airplanes all the time. I, the, the pilot, I know, I know that they're trained. They're going to do a great job. I, I, at no point did the thought pass my mind, there's something to be afraid of. I'm more like inconvenienced that my Coke Zero is spilling, you know? I'm like, ah, that's annoying. He's like, we're going to die. I'm like, no, the Coke Zero is spilling. It's fine. <laughs> but see, a lot of us who are new in this relationship with God, when storms come, we just begin to panic begin to freak out. Why? Proximity problem. A consistency problem. A, a relationship. A, a, we haven't gone to the source enough. You see, when, when you go through enough storms with Jesus on your boat, and you've seen him calm the storm, you're not afraid of tsunamis. You're not afraid of hurt. You're not afraid of what the world throws your way. You're not afraid of the chaos that comes because you, you've been through it with Jesus before. And I want to encourage you to learn to tap into God's promises. Because for some of you, you're new to this relationship with God. And you say, well, pastor, I'm just so new to this. Well, get, that's why God's word is so beautiful. Because there are people who have gone before you, who have endured and gone through. And we get to carry their, their stories, become our stories. And if God did it for them, God can do it for you. It's also why we need the church around us. We need people around us who have gone further. If you're going through a divorce today, don't do it alone. Find another believer who has had to suffer through these same moments. If you're struggling with a terminal disease, don't do it alone. Church online is not enough. You need a, a brother or a sister who has come on the other side of cancer and said, God did it for me. He can do it for you. Don't do it alone. If you're struggling with sin and you're doing it in secret, take off the mask. Get into a group. Say, I'm struggling, but I want to struggle well. Don't do it alone. And some brothers and some sisters will come around you and say, hey, look, God has freed me. I know he'll do it for you. Don't do it alone. Some of us were... It's our first time we're getting on this plane and see the, the truth is is that the presence or the or the absence of peace is the evidence of a lack of faith or the lack of relationship or a lack of intimacy with God. And I just want to encourage you to press into God, press into his people. We need God's presence. We need to stand on his promises. And this third one, a source of peace, is kind of unexpected. But sometimes often, not sometimes, quite regularly, all the time, God is in all of his goodness, takes the worst parts of our life, the most uncomfortable parts of our life, the painful parts of our life, and he redeems them to train us and to develop in us, to, to grow in us a peace, a trust, a hope. 
This is why you know, Paul says that it's, it's through him, through God, that, that we, we gain access. We gain access to God by faith into his grace, which we now stand. Meaning that, that we get to be in a relationship with God because of, because of him alone. We don't earn our way into heaven. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So we brag not on what we can do, but on what God has already done. But he says we don't just boast about that. As Christians, we get to also boast about our suffering. We get to say, hey, when we suffer, we know that suffering produces. Suffering grows. Suffering develops perseverance. And perseverance develops character. And character produces hope. Friends, God is so good that even when we do go through these storms, when we go through these hard moments of life, when we get the diagnosis, when we go through really hard moments, God in all of his infinite wisdom and grace uses even the worst parts of our life for our good. God's not against you. Some of you, the way that you live your life is, 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 is you actually think, some of you did this yesterday. Something bad happened and your first thought was, this must be God's God's judgment for me for what I did. Some of you, your whole relationship with God is that. You think it's causal. You think, you think you, God will love you more if you're better, and God will love you less if you're worse. Now I want you to know that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Here's what's true. God loves you just as you are. Like I have four kids, and I love them just as they are. My kids, they don't pay rent. My kids, they don't clean up. My kids are not very helpful all the time. But I love them. And they're, they're, they're six, four, two, and zero, okay? Like they are all little. Like I've got little kids. And I don't love them for their contribution. I love their art, but I don't love them for their art. I love their jokes, but I don't love them for, th I love them for one reason. They're mine. Guess what? I don't love them more when they do better. I don't love them less when they stress me out. I love them because they're mine. Friends, that's how God sees you. He loves you because you're his. But in the same way that I love my kids as they are, I want my kids to grow up. I want my kids to, to, to meet Jesus. I want my kids to grow in maturity. I want my kids to step into their calling. I want my kids to change the world. I want them to grow up and mature. That's what God wants for you too. He loves you so much, but he doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to be transformed. He wants you to experience this freedom. He wants you to become all that he's called you to be. And he's offering us life. He's offering us peace. He's offering us wholeness. And we tap into the source when we learn to get into his presence, when we begin to stand on his promises. What God is offering for us today is a life with him. I, I, I love it because this process, God's process that's developing us, is that God is working all things. Say all things. all things. All things. God is using all things for the good of those who love him. That's what God wants for you today. He, he doesn't just want peace for you. First, he wants, he doesn't want, it's not about the peace, it's about the love. I, I think it's really interesting because I'm talking about peace and all of us want God's peace, but peace is the byproduct. It's the fruit. It's, the, it, it, it's what we get as a result of a relationship with God. We're not in relationship with God to get peace. We're in a relationship with God and then in his grace, he gives us peace because we love him today. So God's the source. And it's God's presence, it's God's promises, it's God's process, and it's God's purpose. We will find peace in our purpose. If you want peace today, you need to find your purpose. And this is another one. People come to me all the time. Pastor, what's my purpose? I want God to tell me your purpose. Guess what? Can I let you in on a secret? I know your purpose. Lean in. I know your purpose. You've been asking for such a long time. Your purpose is really simple. In fact, we all have the same purpose. No, I don't. Yes, we do. Your purpose is to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. That's why you exist. That is your purpose. Well, pastor, that's not what I'm asking. When I'm asking for my purpose, I'm trying to figure out my career. I'm trying to figure out my dreams. I'm trying to figure out my passions. Great, that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. 
Well, pastor, I love my job and I love my, my skills and I have these passions of mine. Cool. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. So what you're really asking is this. Pastor, what's my purpose? Well, your purpose is to take your passions, to take your gifts, to take your dreams, and to use them as tools to fulfill your purpose, which is to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. Well, Pastor, I'm not really sure. See, I feel like my purpose is to sing. No, it's not. God has given you a tool. He's given you a gift. He's giving you a tool, and the tool is to be leveraged for your purpose. You're supposed to sing to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. Well, pastor, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a starter. No, that's a tool. You're supposed to use entrepreneurship to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. Well, pastor, no, I I just have a passion for teaching kids. Great. That's a tool that God wants to leverage so that you can serve God and, and make an eternal difference in the lives of others. Well, no, pastor, I'm just trying to grow my law firm. No, you're not. You're trying to use your law firm to serve God and to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. These are just tools that God has entrusted to you. You know your purpose, but are you walking in it? Most of us use the tools not to serve God. We use them to serve us. That's why there's no peace. What's great about how God designed his church and how he's designed each and every one of us is that we get to be, live on purpose every single day. Purpose is not a destination. You don't discover it, you don't find it. You choose it and you live in it every single day. You can walk in purpose right now. On your way home, when, you're, when you go hang out with, with your roommate today, ask God, Lord, how can I make an eternal difference in the life of my roommate? It'll change the way you live in front of them. It'll change, your life will become a a, a sermon in and of itself. Why? Because you're gonna live your life on purpose. When you go to the classroom, the boardroom, the courtroom tomorrow, you're not just doing it to get a paycheck. You're doing it to serve, to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. If you want peace, start living in your purpose. I love our declaration over uh, 2024 because, you know, if you've been a part of our church long enough, you know I've never taught Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 because it's one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible. And it's often taught out of context because Jeremiah chapter 29, everyone loves this part. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. I'm gonna prosper you. And everyone's like, yeah. But the context is the whole point of the story. God is saying to his people, Look, I'm about to carry you into the worst season of your life. It's about to be, I mean, what's about to happen, for those of you who don't know the Bible, is that Israel is about to be invaded by a foreign, by a foreign uh, entity. Uh, uh, Babylon's going to come in and literally, like, invade them, be at war, kill people, take them captive, take them back home, like, destroy their culture. Like, it's going to be, like, terrible, 70 years. But following Jesus isn't about escaping pain from this world. It's about having uh, the, the source of strength and peace through the pain of this world. And God says, even though this hard moment's coming, I want you to have this hope. I want you to rest in this peace that no matter what happens in the world around you, I have plans for you. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a hope and a future. So start walking in your purpose today. Stop hoping that tomorrow your purpose will come and live in it today. And I love our church because our church is so activated on living on purpose, living on mission for Jesus. And God's been expanding what we've been doing here as a church family. And I'm really stoked because as so many of you know, we've been talking about the East Village for a while. A, a church came to us and said, hey, look, we don't want to close our doors. Uh, we don't want to just sell our building to the marketplace. We want this to remain a church in the East Village. If we, if we gave you this building, would you, would you plant a new church in the East Village? And, 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 and to which we prayed and we felt like God said yes. And that's why I'm really excited because on January 7th, we're having our first East Village launch team interest meeting. And, and I wanna invite you. Yeah, I think that, that's a place where, where we cheer and, and thank God. Because on January 7th, 
at 6 p.m. on a Sunday, we're having our very first interest meeting. And, and here's the reality. Some of you, you travel from Brooklyn, you take the L train, you take all sorts of trains to get here, or maybe you live more downtown. Man, it, it seems to me that if that's you, then God has already positioned you to be a part of planting a brand new life-giving church in a neighborhood that needs Jesus just as much as Harlem does. And I want to invite you to be a part of it. What's our interest meeting? It's going to be a night, but Pastor and Chris and I, we're going to be there tonight of worship. It's a night of connecting with each other, but hearing the vision for being a part of planning a brand new church. And maybe I want to just remind us, this isn't just for our church. This is for any friends you may have who are disconnected from the body of Christ. This is for anyone you know downtown who you know they need uh, a life-giving church. It's so exciting to be a part of the ground floor, being a part of this. And I want to invite you to text just the two letters, EV, you get it, East Village, right? EV to 646-713-2393. And we're going to just send you the form so you can register to be a part of that today. But I, I, I'm believing that as, as each and every one of us learns to walk out our God-given purpose, as we, as we learn and understand that the process that we're going through in this life, any pain that we experience, as we learn to stand on God's promise, as we learn to tap into God's presence, that we can have peace in any and every situation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, can you bow your heads and can you close your eyes today? And I want to take a moment and I want to pray God's peace over your life. I want to pray that the peace that passes understanding would rule no matter what you're going through today. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you just begin to talk to God and just say, God, I need your peace in this season. I don't want to find peace through other means. God, you are my source of peace. So God, I pray, God, over your church that you would bless us, God, with the, that, that sense of restfulness, God, in the midst of the, the storms of this life that we would learn to trust in you and that, God, I just, just pray against anxiety and replace it with peace in Jesus' name. And God, I pray for those of us who are at war relationally. God, I pray that you would show us where we need to repent, where we need to apologize, God, and where we need to forgive. And God, I just pray, God, that, 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 that families would be reunited, God, that, that relationships would be mended, God, and that we would stop being at war with others. And God, and I pray, God, that we would stop being at war with sin. God, I declare freedom over your people. God, freedom from sin in Jesus' name. God, would we not be entangled with this world, but would we disconnect and reconnect with you? God, we're asking for wholeness and completeness today in Jesus' name. And I want to pray a second prayer. If you're here, everything I'm talking about, this peace that God offers, God being our source, it's kind of dependent on the first call. Are you going to go to God as your source? Are you going to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? The Bible says that all you have to do to enter into eternal relationship with Jesus is to confess and believe. Confess that he's Lord. That means he's in charge of your life. He's God. And, 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 and believe in your heart. Believe what? Believe that he's God. Believe that he died for you. Believe that he rose again. If you confess and believe, that's the first decision. And if you make that first decision, the Bible says that you're saved. And some of us today, for being honest, I'm talking about making Jesus Christ your Lord, making him in charge. If you're being honest, you'd say, he hasn't been in charge. You've been in charge. And if you've been in charge of your own life as of late, you're in good company because so many of us have been in your shoes. And we made a better decision and we decided to say, you know what, I'm done being in charge. Being in charge has gotten you to where you are. Now let's give Jesus Christ, let's let him be the captain. Let's let him take us to where he's calling us to go. We know that we can trust in him. And if you wanna give your life to Jesus, maybe it's for the first time or your first time in a long time, I just want you to raise your hand on the count of three. I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna have you stand up, I'm not gonna bring you down to the front. But on the count of three, if you wanna give your life to Jesus, you wanna recommit to Jesus, one, Two, three. Come on, lift up your hands all over this place. Yes, I see you and I see you and I see you and I see you. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Yes, so many friends. Yes, 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 so many friends. Come on, you can put your hands down. We're gonna pray a prayer. I want you to mean this from the bottom of your heart. Let's just, let's just pray something like this together. Repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I give you my entire life. My past, my present, and my future. I'm giving you all of me because I want all of you. So God, I receive your forgiveness and I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Today I choose to live for you. I'm yours, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said.
Amen, 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 amen. Well, hey.